Good evening, everyone. My name is Kevin Butterfield. I am the executive director of the Fred W. Smith National Library for the Study of George Washington at Mount Vernon. Welcome to tonight's Martha Washington Lecture. I'm thrilled to welcome you. It's an exciting and wonderful opportunity, and thank you for participating tonight in this virtual event. It was created to share new scholarship, insights into the life of Martha Washington uh, and women's history uh, around the period. And this year, we have a wonderful tribute uh, to Mary Wiseman, uh, but the, all of this first, I need to mention our wonderful donors that have made this possible, the Richard S. Reynolds Foundation of Richard, Richmond, Virginia. Uh, thank you for your continued support uh, for this uh, important event. Tonight's event is entitled Honoring Lady Washington, Character Interpretation at Historic Sites, and it's a, tri a tribute to Mary Wiseman, a tribute to her marvelous career at Mount Vernon. Uh, she has portrayed Martha Washington uh, and has learned and has helped many other people learn about the entire field of historic character interpretation. And we'll have an opportunity to hear her in just a moment. But first, let me introduce Jeremy Ray, my colleague, Mount Vernon's Director of Interpretation. Jeremy oversees a talented staff of 75 frontline uh, interpreters, uh, is a marvelous colleague, someone who helps educate, prepare our interpreters uh, to encounter more than a million visitors uh, each year. Uh, thank you so much, Jeremy, uh, for tonight's event. Jeremy. Well, good evening, and thank you, Kevin. Uh, as he mentioned, my name is Jeremy Ray. I'm the Director of Interpretation here at Mount Vernon. And this popular event was created to share new scholarship and insights into the life and times of Martha Washington. And tonight, we are paying special tribute to the groundbreaking career of Mary Wiseman. She recently retired from her role as officially portraying Martha Washington here at Mount Vernon for the past 17 years. Mary's career in character interpretation began 45 years ago at Colonial Williamsburg, where she developed training programs, conducted primary source research, and guided tours and programs through the historic area. In 1981, she created a new interpretation plan for the governor's palace, employing living history actors for the first time. Mary created the concept of character interpretation by removing the reliance on scripted work and challenging staff to possess detailed knowledge of the period and character they were portraying. In 1991, Mary once again revolutionized the field when as artistic director for character interpretation, she added the title of manager of women's history. It was in this role that she began researching and making the connections between Williamsburg and a woman named Martha Dandridge Custis, which was a role that she started portraying and took on in 1996. In April of 2004, Mary began her role as Lady Washington at Mount Vernon. In the ensuing years, Mary dazzled countless visitors, both at official events and day to day where she held court in our interpretive center. In that time, Mary has dazzled millions of guests, but we also wanna focus on the impact Mary has had on the field of character interpretation. Mary has worked with and mentored so many who have gone on to become leaders in the museum field. And I'm very fortunate that tonight we have two such guests. So later we'll speak with Christy Coleman, who was named the executive director of the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation in January of 2020. Prior to this, Christy served 12 years as CEO of the American Civil War Museum. Christy is an innovator and thought leader with over 30 years of museum and public history experience. She's dedicated herself to correcting the American narrative, particularly of the colonial, revolutionary, and Civil War eras by placing the diverse peoples and their impact back into history. She's been a featured guest on many news and television outlets, and most recently, she was featured in the History Channel's Grant miniseries. Chrissy has also served as historical consultant for award-winning film, for, for the award-winning film Harriet and Showtime's Good Lord Bird. Christy is the recipient of three honorary doctorates from the College of William and Mary, the Virginia Commonwealth University, and the University of the South for decades of impact. And when you really think character interpretation, a lot of people automatically go to Colonial Williamsburg. So we'll also be joined later by Beth Kelly, the Vice President of Education, Research, and Historical Interpretation at the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. She's worked with the foundation since 1989 in a variety of interpretive and management positions. Beth's passion is connecting guests with the past so that they can better understand the present and forge the future with broader understanding. Beth is focused on creating the very best guest service 
and frequently speaks to museums from Virginia to New York, instructing professionals on how to deliver effective and memorable, uh, memorable service. She recently lectured with graduating students in advanced history studies at the Johns Hopkins University. But before we go to speak with our guests, I want to reiterate the power character interpretation has to capture its audience. It, it's spectacular. In fact, for me personally, I started out uh, in college uh, in a completely different field. It was actually on a family trip to the Colonial Williamsburg era uh, area back in around 2005 that I met with a character interpreter that really changed my perspective and, and inspired me to change majors and to pursue a career in the museum field. So Mary Wiseman has played a huge part in that and her accolades are endless. Uh, guests commented here at Mount Vernon constantly that she was truly a national treasure. So before we begin, I want to give you all one last opportunity at Lost in Time with Lady Washington. Give us one moment. We have a nice little tribute we're going to play for her. Wonderful to have everybody here today. Spring has finally come. I'm enjoying my flowers. You know, I always love my garden. Good to have the children here about me. Hi, Mrs. Washington. I have my, my grandchildren here with me today. I understand that you also raised your grandchildren and were with them every step of the way. I, I was indeed, and I think there's a special bond between grandchildren and their grandparents. This young man, he's your grandson? He is. And how old are you, young man? Six. Do you know that is the time I can see you're wearing your first breeches. That is when a little boy comes out of his petticoats and he becomes a little man and he begins to go to school and learn. Are you going to school? Do you like books? You know, teaching the young children has become very important these days. We are a new country, and mothers and grandmothers must teach how to be good citizens as well as how to learn the, the topics regularly taught. There was a young boy who learned very well how to be a good citizen when he was young. His initials are G. W. Do you know who that would be? Could it be the general, George Washington himself? When he was reading to my grandchildren, he enjoyed reading this little book. And I, I always like sharing it with the children. It was, it was the first book ever written for children. And as children must always learn, these little stories in the little pretty pocketbook always have a lesson. Would you like to learn the general's favorite story, Jonathan? Yeah. Come a little closer so you can see the picture. Books with pictures are always very exciting. Can you see the wolf there? See the wolf for the boy? Can you see, young lady? You're learning to, to read too, are you not? There's the wolf. This is the story of a shepherd now listen carefully it's a very short story but it's got a very important lesson. a wanton young shepherd boy you know he goes and takes care of the sheep wanton means he's a naughty boy though no danger was near cried out to his neighbors the wolf sir is here they all came and are laughed at. There wasn't really a wolf. He was just pretending to see if they would come and help him. Soon, though, he roared out again. Now the wolf's here indeed. But his cries were in vain. When the real wolf came, no one came to help him. Now, do you know why that might have been? Was he telling the truth the first time? And so he got a, a, 
reputation, he began to be known as a boy who didn't tell the truth. And when he needed help, it didn't come. And the general likes this story because he's always been known for his honesty. In fact, he likes a little saying. I think it's well worth learning. Honesty is the best policy. That means always be honest. You know, there's a secret to learning. If you say something three times together, you'll always remember. So let's everyone join in and learn his favorite saying. Are we ready? Honesty is the best policy. Honesty is the best policy. Honesty is the best policy. A very good way to live. The general also learned that you have to keep busy, and I learned that when I was growing up, too. I've been working on my sewing, and I see our young ladies here. I was taught that you never sit idle. You're always mending. You're always seeing to your family. Do you girls, are you studying the needle? Yes. Oh, and you do mending? And how about fancy work? Not much of that. Oh, you remind me of, of my granddaughter, Nellie. She liked to do fancy work, work, too. When I was young, I remember, I would show my stitches to my, my mother, and she very often didn't think I'd done quite, quite well enough. She'd say, pull those out and begin again until I got so... I could do all the mending and the plain work, but I like doing a little fancy work. I'm making a bell pull now. It's going to be a little gift. And I chose as my theme the four wives. Can you see the birds here? I've always been a great fancier of birds. I like birds. And I remember my father always would take me for walks in the woods of New Kent, and he'd point out the birds. He came from England, and they didn't have the cardinal bird there. So people from England loved the cardinal bird. And I can remember I asked my brother Bartholomew to capture me a cardinal bird. And I remember I said to him, now, I want the male bird. I want him because he's colored such beautiful red. Do you know what the cardinal looks like, the red feathers? Mm -hmm. But have you ever taken note of his little mate, the female? Look at her. You would hardly even notice her, would you? And I remember saying, don't catch me the female. She isn't pretty at all. Well, my father took me to task, and he said, don't you understand, Patsy, my girl? She is so designed by her divine creator so that her feathers will cover her eggs, her young, in the nest. And thus the divine creator has assigned even to the birds their role in life. And you're fortunate to be born of the female sex because inside you is that ability to take care. And I've always taken care of my family ever since. I enjoyed raising my grandchildren. I did have a little bit of difficulty with my grandson not wanting to study. Now, you look to be about the age of a young student. Well, I'm sorry about that, folks. It seems that we are uh, experiencing some te technical difficulties at this point. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to get it back shortly. But I hope everyone could take a moment just to really see what really makes character interpretation so special. Uh, what Mary is doing in this is that she's she's not reading off of a script at all. She fully understands and embodies the persona that is Martha Washington. And she really tries to see who her audience is and then engages with them. So when she has students, she's trying to relate some sort of story that she has uh, as Martha Washington, and then just moves back and forth. Uh, it really is that effortlessness that really makes it so 
inspiring that really pulls in the audience and you can see everybody's faces there everybody is focused in on mary as she is going along um, so i think when you're talking about good character interpretation it really has to be believable and there's just this mix of everything involved there with historical knowledge and acting ability uh, and then just being being believable um, we have hopefully we'll be able to get the video back up but if not um, I really want to take this this time, this unscheduled time, to really talk about why she has been so important to me uh, in my growth here at Mount Vernon. It's, it's that uh, ability to be so empathetic and understanding is really what makes Mary so special, and I think what is what really makes her so believable um, is when you're when you're looking at somebody who's supposed to take on kind of this loving persona. If you actually are that as a human being, it really does make it uh, that much easier, that much better, uh, and 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 believable. Um, so I think uh, at this point, it, it doesn't really look like we're going to be able to get uh, the video back. But I think if uh, if we're able to, maybe we could bring in uh, our Martha Washington and maybe begin our discussion with her. Uh, so here we see in this beautiful portrait in the background, Martha Washington has, has come out and joined us. And joining us this evening, we have the incomparable Mary Wiseman. Mary, welcome. Thank you. How are you doing? Well, it's quite an unusual situation to be talked about and to be hearing it while you're still alive, you know. But uh, I thank you for all the things you said. As you can see, I'm still Mrs. Washington. And it's very hard to come out of character. But for you and for this occasion, I shall make the effort. You know, there's a great tradition that when a magician has departed the earthly plane, he is given a tribute, and in that tribute, his fellow magicians allow that his magic wand be ceremoniously broken. And that ends the magic that was his own uh, profession. And in a way, I'm going to break the wand right now here at my beloved Mount Vernon. I'm sitting very much at the very same spot where I first came to meet and research the character of Mrs. Washington. So I've come full circle, and um, if you're ready, I'm ready to break the wand. Absolutely, Mary. Uh, so I think I think the first question that a lot of people want to know, because it, it's such a fascinating thing, I think so many people are really enraptured going to places like Mount Vernon and Jamestown, Yorktown, and Colonial Williamsburg, and meeting all of these people who have such really cool jobs and talking about history. So what inspired you to get into this line of work? Well, I, I really can imagine myself almost 50 years ago when I arrived in Virginia. And uh, I arrived at a wonderful place, Colonial Williamsburg, not knowing that much about American history, but always loving the past. And I was fortunate enough to become one of the uh, guides there, trained in a magnificent way to understand the history of that colonial past. We were taught uh, everything one needed to know about architecture, and decorative arts, and all of the buildings. We studied long and hard. And then finally the day came when we were given our own group to take all through the historic area. And I remember they started us out with fourth graders. And I thought to myself, how can I make these children enjoy this, this trek through this old town? And it came to me uh, there with that very first group as I stepped out into the world of interpretation. And I said to them, you know, children, if footprints could last 200 years, you'd be walking in George Washington's footprints. And I'll never forget when the magic started for me, a little girl about half an hour later raised her hand and she said, Mrs. Wiseman, Mrs. Wiseman, I see one. I see George Washington's footprint. <laughs> and I knew then how one can inspire the imagination of, uh, about the past for young and I found out later for every age, there's something about a personal association with history. History is all really the memories of individual people and uh, history are events, but what about the people who lived through those? Somehow when you can make that history a very pointed and personal experience, then it opens the door for visitors to take in the wider view. And that really began what I have 
followed this long path. I think it's interesting that I started with George Washington's footprints and they eventually led me right here to my beloved Mount Vernon. But I had many years, many happy years, 30 years there in Colonial Williamsburg. I played many different characters over that time. I learned the trades. I, I learned uh, hearthside cooking. So Chris will tell you not very well. And uh, we learned of the society so that it was very much a part of my own memory. Mrs. Washington. And as she had had so much association there, I felt that I'd almost, we'd known the same people as it were. Yeah. I was so inspired by her story. Uh, you mentioned the Women's History Project and each year we would have a special focus. But when I began to research Mrs. Washington, I, I called that year's effort beside the great man, not behind him. And I remember gasping in the middle of the research library. I did not know all that she did, that she went to every camp during the war, everything this remarkable woman did to contribute to create the presidency and, and all that she did to help in that way. And I felt someone's got to bring attention to her. And of course, that led me to the place where I have had so many happy years and, and to the experience of living alongside the Washingtons, as it were, for the past 25 years. Yeah, well, so you brought that up. You said you're following in the in the footsteps of Washington and the research and everything that you did, and that's where you came across Martha Washington and and again researching all of her great history. But I'm I'm kind of curious then what what made you physically decide to come up to Mount Vernon uh, to do your work as as Martha Washington? Well, I I, I guess it's the simple answer, and it, it it never really satisfied a lot of my friends who kept saying you're leaving, you're moving to Northern Virginia. I lived in the historic area, I sang in a, the beloved Bruton Parish Church where her great grandfather you know, was the first rector. But I, I felt compelled to do it. I'd been doing a few guest appearances here at Mount Vernon. And I felt that the experience the visitors had here, while it was a wonderful one, left out that ability to know about her. In fact, there had never been a, a one of the founding members of our history who was every day a part of the interpretive experience at the home where they lived. And I thought I should bring her home. Now, the this even simpler answer is, forgive me, I could say I fell in love with George Washington and uh, that changed everything. Uh, I wanted so much to contribute. And so I made the journey the very same week that she moved to Mount Vernon as a bride the first week of April. I didn't plan it that way, but uh, Providence has had quite a hand in, in helping me follow those footsteps. And uh, I never looked back. I've, I've been very privileged because I think that as visitors come here, she was such a, in her day, such a warm and welcoming presence. And I've hoped to add that. I think Mrs. Washington suffers a great deal from those portraits of her. She always looks so stern and she doesn't look from the portraits as though she would be someone you'd want to be around. But reading here at Mount Vernon accounts of visitors who'd come, everyone said she was so kind. She begged us not to, to leave. She had a lot of warmth. So I think I put the smile on her face as it were and, and brought out those qualities that had been hidden by history. That was a great privilege to do and a surprise for everybody to meet her in that way. Well, you had mentioned the, the contributions uh, of Martha Washington and, and I don't think it really should be understated, the contributions that you have made to the field of character interpretation as a whole. Uh, in your career, it is, it is amazing to see all of the individuals who have gone on to become leaders in the museum field. And we, we are very fortunate to have in my view, two titans of the industry, people I really look up to uh, for all of their contributions. So uh, I'd like, if we can, if we could have Christy Coleman uh, from Jamestown Yorktown Foundation, Beth Kelly from the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation also join us um, here. Thank you so much for, for uh, taking part in our, our honoring of Mary Wiseman. There you are. I'm so glad to see you. You know, I, I don't know how many years ago we can say that we first knew one another, but I remember a teenage girl who was one of the most amazing people I met even at her young age. And there she is, my beloved Christy. I'm so <laughs> glad to meet you. 
I, I've never been one to truly embrace technology, as you can imagine. But this is wonderful. And Beth, thinking that's an understatement, them, Mary. <laughs> they know me too well. It's so wonderful to see you, even in these circumstances. And I hope that we can we can see each other often again. It's wonderful to think of what you've both done in, in your careers. I'm so proud of you both. Oh, thank you, Mary. That's so quintessential, Mary. Mary. <laughs> Well, so while, while we have it, you actually mentioned that uh, you, you worked with Christy when she was uh, a teenager. And Christy, I think you have a very interesting story to, to share about uh, some of that time working together with Mary. Oh, yeah, um, you know, working with Mary was, was terrific. And, and um, yeah, I started working at Colonial Williamsburg uh, at 17 and um, doing the character interpreter piece. And um, it was you know, it was quite an experience. I mean, you know, that was 40 years ago and people didn't really understand what we were doing, especially in terms of the black characters, let alone some of the staffing. And Mary was um, just this, you know, wonderfully warm presence that was up there in the James Anderson house, you know, to greet us every day and to make sure we were okay and, and that sort of thing. And we continued to work together over the years. And I left Tony Williamsburg and then came back around 1989 and immediately reconnected with Mary and we started doing some things together. But our most amazing experience was when um, the two of us went to um, Tunbridge Wells, England for this um, event that was being hosted by a, a, an old mutual friend. Um, uh, and it was this whole village area Tunbridge Wells had historically had been this place where the very well-to-do and the, the, the gentry throughout uh, uh, England would gather in the, in the summers for the cooling springs and the healthy air. And, and it was really quite the, the to-do. And so Mary and I had been invited to go and spend a week here because this was a special festival where they had character actors from, you know, basically all over Europe. Uh, and principally in England that would come and gather and do this like 24 seven kind of experience. And Mary and I went to portray um, uh, one of the, Ran I, mean, I believe it was Mrs. Randolph, right, Mary? Uh, Betty Randolph, yeah. Yes, uh, to portray Mrs. Randolph who was coming to England to visit her, her, her family and she was bringing with her her personal maidservant slave. And this was the, you know, like the big thing because they'd never had anyone portray an enslaved person before at the festival. And so there were all of these things that we did. And, and you know, they had, they had other characters that had, you know, little Irish girls, or just like girls, but young women who were playing Irish servants. And, you know, there were footmen and there were all that kind of stuff, but I was the only one. And so Mary and I worked out these extraordinary scenes together because she was, to participate in the, I'll never forget the tea, right, Mary? Just the tea. There was the tea. There was the special tea that was being held, right? And and um, and and so the problem was that the the Irish girl had no idea how to properly do tea, how to do properly do a tea, and so um, so I was to train this girl while it was happening and what you know how to move what side of the table do you put, put put things down you know to quietly correct this girl so there was a lot of the point is i guess there's a lot of subtlety that could happen um with character portrayals which you don't always get from the written word or from a tour right i mean the, the ability to add that empathy um that empathy piece and to to see the dynamics. And Mary had, you know, we had worked out this little thing where Mary could just very subtly do something like that and I knew what she needed me to do. And and we did these little, there were just these little subtle hand signals and these little subtle things the way we did it. Meanwhile, I would do little subtle things to let the audience know what I was feeling in the moment until it was time for me to depart from her and have an opportunity to engage with audience privately and then you know and it was just so I, I loved those moments and and mary and i had a habit of as soon as we got back we were like how do we create those kind of moments at colony Williamsburg? how do we how do we do this um a lot different so and and that began began a different kind of journey together of figuring out how to 
create these moments um, that demonstrated power and authority and subjugation and, and, and at the same time, resilience, right? And strength of character and um, all of these other things that, that we were able to do when we worked together. So, you know, there's, as she said, there's a, there's a brilliance to character interpretation when it's done well. Um, when it's done poorly, it's just hokey and it's offensive and, and I can't stand it. And, and I go running in the other direction whenever I see people doing it poorly. Um, it's not a game. It is a form of learning and it's a form of teaching. And if you were not serious about that, um, you shouldn't be doing it. And, you know, the, the visitor who has encountered a really great character interpreter like Mary Wiseman, who is a master of her craft, a master of her trade, you will be changed. You can't help to be changed. And I know that even in the in the demeanor of, of Martha Washington's graciousness, I know that she has tackled some pretty challenging questions um, about Martha and George and that estate and life at Mount Vernon. And and I can guarantee you she's done it um, with with grace and a little humor, but always with scholarship and responding appropriately. You know, and 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 when I say responding appropriately, I mean giving the answers that are appropriate to the period, and are and are true to the character she has created, based on that scholarship. Yeah, that's great. Uh, there's a lot of awesome stuff to really unpack with what you were talking about there, Christy. So uh, when especially the whole dynamic about the trust. Uh, that had to be developed between you and Mary and those roles that you were working on, um, you know, breaking down the history and the scholarship, what makes a good history, a character interpreter versus a bad character interpreter. So let's, let's get into some of those. I think first I want to go to, go to Beth and say, you know, what are, what are some of the processes for training staff uh, for the work that you do? Because you have such a huge staff down there at Columbia Williamsburg. What, what does that process look like? Sure, we're glad to answer that. So one of the things that we do is we have a, a core curriculum that certainly all of our interpreters go through, but particularly for the actor interpreters, character interpreters, or, or um, nation builders, it's a lot of time spent with primary sources. Uh, that's where they're really kind of getting into the language of the period and understanding the period. There's also a mentorship quality or, or uh, aspect to their training. Uh, so uh, Mary, actually, uh, when I was an interpreter, was one of uh, a mentor for me. So she took our training class and uh, we were in costume for one of the first times and she showed us how to do our courtesies and she talked to us about language and how to hold ourselves. And that's very different from the way we as modern people hold ourselves, even in costume. So just getting used to the clothing and working with seasoned veterans who can help uh, them understand the past and navigate the past. And then it is just pairing up with a historian. So our character interpreters, actor interpreters, nation builders, they work directly with one of our historians to answer questions and to guide them. For some of the character interpreters, there is a longer training period than others. It just depends on the the, well, to be frank, how well known the character is. Uh, so you have to go really in depth if you're going to be portraying someone like a Thomas Jefferson or a Patrick Henry, uh, because the public knows all of that. So they, they will know all of those details about the person. Uh, the training period is uh, much shorter, not much shorter, but it's a little bit shorter for someone who's not as well known uh, because uh, we can get them out there, get them doing ensemble pieces and get them working with the public. Uh, by shorter, I mean, it's six months versus nine months in some cases uh, for that. So it, it's quite a long lead time. It's not anything that anybody comes off the street and just begins to do. Uh, the training period uh, is very important. And as I said, mentorship is important, but just that time with those primary documents is really, really critical for, for our team. So, so I actually wanna follow, do a follow-up question with you based off of how you answered that. Um, I, I think oftentimes interpreting women's roles or enslaved people has often been seen as difficult due to scant historical record. It be that you know work that other historians have done or not necessarily looking in the right places to find that information. So what depths do you need to go to in order to find the thread to actually create these characters if it is more difficult to find information on a lesser known character, as you said? So research is always being done by the present 
and and has and through the lens of the present and whoever the researcher is so what we find sometimes and I'll, uh, to be honest is that sometimes uh, someone who perhaps is living a similar life may find a different way into the past or into the research and understand it better than perhaps someone who may have been looking for something different so for example you may look at a runaway slave ad and the runaway slave ad may tell you the clothing that that person was wearing. But somebody that's been doing a lot of research on enslaved people will find a much deeper, more um, uh, robust story because they know more about what other enslaved people were wearing. They know more about the life of the enslaved on the plantation that that runaway slave ad at face value may just tell you one thing. But for that person who's researching an enslaved character, they are looking in my, and, and, and really mining more information out of it. So the, the information is, 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 it's there more than you think it is. Uh, it's just written in a lot of subtleties. Um, you may think people were in the shadows and they certainly are maybe not as prominent as some of the well-known uh, nation builders we may think of, but they're there and you can find out quite a bit of information about people. Sometimes you have to do a composite. Sometimes you know the person, you know a little bit about them, and then you have to fill in with some other composite information. That's where you lean on some of your more senior staff, you lean on your historians to make sure that it is grounded. Uh, Christy said something really important about what Mary has always done and what Christy always did as well, which is it's always grounded in some scholarship. Uh, so it's not anything that's made up, it's, it's embedded in there somehow, some way, even a composite character. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Christy, I know at your site, you guys have uh, uh, folks who portray the indigenous people of the Paspahag tribe. So what challenges or responsibilities is there for proper representation in character interpretation? Well, um, as a point of clarification, at the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation, we don't do character work. We do scripted work. Um, we do have um, native Algonquin peoples who work in our Paspahe town. And um, it is, you know, you know, in terms of the research and the work that they're doing, you know, certainly they're in historical clothing. They're doing historic, you know, trades and cultural um, pieces that they're trying to build. Um, but character work is not something we do. We tend to do more scripted work. And that's just a matter of, um, it has been in the past, a matter of um, choice uh, in terms of the forms of interpretation that they've wanted to do. And so, um, especially recognizing that it can be far more difficult for people of color to do character work, um, it, it, it does, take a different kind of emotional toll um, and it takes a different kind of institutional awareness and support for a person to be able to do that work for any extended period of time because you know if you're if you if you're doing the character work it's not just the memory that you're working through or the scholarship that you're working through you're trying to build real emotion and so can you imagine having to carry that emotion all day or a significant portion of the day and figuring out how to, to show that. I mean, you know, we read in, in uh, entertainment magazines about actors who take on the role and they are so immersed and when they come out, they're just exhausted. Well, imagine having to do that as your job every day, especially, again, if you're playing a person of color who's disenfranchised, who has um, any variety of, of assaults against their, their human and civil rights, that's hard. And so if you don't have the infrastructure organizationally to support um, those, those actors in that space and to be able to provide them other opportunities for growth and learning and the ability to step away, um, then you shouldn't be doing it. And so, and Jamestown did not have that luxury, you know, uh, out, out of the 350 to 400 staff members that are there, the indigenous team was that at its height was maybe seven people. And that's a heck of a burden to carry for seven people. So, you know, the, the decision was made that in each of the spaces, the, the living history areas, that um, it, you know, it, it was just general staffing who wanted to tell those stories, but not necessarily who were telling those stories in character. So it, it is different um, that way. And I, and I think that that sometimes is confusing for guests 
um, because they see <clears throat> everybody in historical clothing and they think that everybody's a character and they're not right. Um, and, and when you're in an open, I remember, you know, one of the, that used to be one, when character interpretation really took off at CW, that used to be the annoyance of the trade people <laughs> or the annoyance of others. They're like, you know, oh, God, I am I am actually a bookbinder or I am actually, you know, and no, I'm not playing a character. This is what I do. I mean, you know, so we had to we had to figure out ways to help the visitor understand who was who. And and I and that's generally when they started, you know, I think more people would see. Um, I don't know if you guys are still doing that. Are you still doing that, Beth? Yes, we talk about where some, yeah. some people are. Yeah, in so general, you start yeah. advertising where they are in general and mm -hmm. and or locations where you can interact with them. So that you know that was designed to try to cut down on that confusion. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Yeah. yeah, I definitely understand that. We have the same thing where we have trades folks here at, at Mount Vernon and our characters, and that's something we're shifting to is is advertising more where the characters are going to be to kind of create that. But it, it's interesting because I want to maybe leave this open for both of you is then how what what support structures are needed or how, what do you put in place to help support your staff who are either portraying or talking about marginalized communities from the past? Mm -hmm. And I don't mind telling you what we're doing uh, at Colony Williamsburg. We have, first of all, we try to set our guests up with the expect expectations of how we expect them to interact with our staff. So um, particularly after the last year, last several years, uh, we have had some very difficult conversations uh, that we're trying to unpack through our ensemble pieces with our actor interpreters uh, and very thoughtful conversations. But it, it can touch off emotions for some of our guests. And some of our guests have been less than gracious towards our employees. So we try to set up the expectation right away. This is how we expect you to interact with our team. If you don't, we will escort you off the premises. Uh, this is how the rules of engagement will work for us. We do that through our advertising or, or and on our map, but also through all various orientation spots. So various places that the guests get information of what's going to happen that is embedded into the introduction. And you all know we have an open air multiple entry place. So we have to kind of hit this from a couple of different places. So we're trying to protect people uh, or, or at least set up that expectation. We also schedule people a little bit differently from when and Mary and maybe Christy were there, which is we usually pair everybody up, if not triple people up. But we do make sure that nobody is left alone, particularly our Black interpreters. We're more trying to make sure that they always have somebody with them. And we also have American Indian interpreters as well. So we make sure that they are paired up women as well. So there's we're, we're doing the scheduling and trying to pair people up. There are some safe words or some things that they know amongst each other, just like Christy and Mary were talking about that security they felt and that trust they had with each other. We try to build that within the team as well. But there's, there is long-term effects and can be, as Christy uh, mentioned. And so we give once a month a time for just the interpreters who are Black to be by themselves. No manage Well, there could be management if they're, if they're Black, but there's nobody in there to listen to what they have to say. They talk to each other. I don't know what happens in there, but they're given time to be able to talk to each other, decompress, share with one another, be in a room where they can talk about what is going on and what some of their experiences are. That mentorship program kind of kicks in there. Um, they're uh, definitely leaning on one another to work through that. We also have a very strong employee assistance program and we have a peer support team now. So the peer support team is designed for for any of the team, um, but is designed particularly if you have a bad interaction uh, with a guest or a negative interaction, you can reach out to a peer support team member who is clinically trained and licensed by just like a, a fireman or uh, any first responder would have to help you kind of walk through that immediate trauma uh, of what you've just gone through. So uh, that's just a couple of the different ways, very new to us within the last three or four years that we've been doing that. It hasn't mitigated everything, so we have some refinement to do, but those are the support systems that we're trying to put in place. Um, you'd think it's fun and, and, and these kinds of things wouldn't have to happen, but they do. 
Uh, you know, we're going through a lot of uh, very difficult times through our country right now. And sometimes they're taking it out on the very person that's standing there trying to help them understand about the past so they can understand our present, but they take it out on that interpreter. And it's just not anything that we're going to tolerate. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, it is definitely difficult. And I think a lot of support is is very, very important. And I, I do want to go back to to Mary here at this moment, because I think a lot of her work as uh, shown with working with you guys have got everybody thinking about how we better support each other. Uh, and Mary, again, you've been such an integral part of training so many people who have gone on to continue to do all these journeys. So I got a question for you. What makes a good character interpreter? Is it acting, historical knowledge? Is there a best practice for engaging the audience and pulling them in? Effectively, I'm asking you to, to distill down your 45 years of experience to tell us what makes you so good. Oh, you know, I, I have to tell you that I, I'm probably still known as the bane of the human resources department's existence <laughs> because when I was hiring uh, for uh, characters at uh, Colonial Williamsburg, I would put on the form, reason for not hiring lacks the arc of light. You know, and they go, we can't. And I said, no, the arc of light, that's the reach. You have to hire someone who wants to reach out and teach or doesn't have a sense of the period. And they, they'd call and say, this will not, this will not play. We have to have, you know, <laughs> the years they've done. But it, and, and, you know, the variety and, and uh, both Chrissy and Beth, it, it's amazing looking back on the first characters, women uh, who'd never been actors, uh, uh, Grandmother Getty, and Mrs. Vogue. Uh, a, a, an ex-military man, Captain Stewart, uh, wonderful trained actors, uh, Jeremy Freed, who's gone to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, I mean, all kinds of people come to this this point. But I think what they all share, and I think it's, it's true for every interpreter, you have to want to give that information out. And it has to be about giving it out. I always say, if a tree falls in the forest and you can't interpret it, it hasn't fallen. So there's every there's always a teachable moment. I'm never relaxing myself from thinking I could be teaching this. That has to come from inside. And so as well as having that sense of period and being able to, to learn the effect that you will have in portraying a person of another time, that person yourself has to have that desire to reach out and I think you've been touching on such wonderful aspects of where we are today and where we were. You know, I'm, I'm proud that I was one of the people who started the Visitor Companion because I could advertise where people could come and meet the characters. And, and it was wonderful for them um, to be able to know how they could chart their visit. And I think as we go forward too, context is so important. We need to be able to set up the experience for our visitors, what, what they're going to be um, uh, participating in, what they're going to be seeing, if it's the theme. We, we have, I think, in, in this day and age, and with the American public, not as, uh, putting it uh, politely, not as well-versed in American history, you have to help them along when they come to a historical site. You've got to answer a lot of those questions that are going to get in the way of them taking in the other information. So I think introductions and in any way, whether it's in print or whether you have somebody there, very important. And also, I do believe too, that after an experience, it's good to have someone for the visitors to talk with about what they've seen. And, and I will say also, when we talk about the sensitive time that we're living in, uh, for, for everyone interpreting, uh, you can imagine uh, the situation now of people coming to Mount Vernon and asking about um, uh, the general and Mrs. Washington who had enslaved people and they're looking at me in a certain way uh, and, and they're, they're, they're wanting to understand how this very nice lady could be involved in something like that. And, you know, it, 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 is, it, it, it takes a toll on all of us emotionally because we want to give a very true account. We want to have the visitor understand where that person was in their time, they only knew their time. But we have to have that bridge to how we all, in a sense, we're all becoming Americans. We, the, the, we were all evolving. George Washington evolved, we're, we are as a country evolving. And I think in, in a very important way, our historical sites can do a great deal to help the country along in this understanding. 
So it's a great challenge that is ahead for everyone. And I, I think we're in good hands when I, when I think of the two of you. I really have been very proud to, to be a part of it, but it is an evolution and we're, we're working along together. I always say a, a character is, is not an actor or a reenactor. They are more than anything else a teacher. And it's wonderful to have, and we have had marvelous actors acting scenes, and it's wonderful to go and see reenactments and uh, uh, people who are completely within that period in their own head. But the interpreter is there, I think, as an instrument uh, to tie the past and the present. And you always have to have that, that desire inside yourself that you're going to, with your arc of light, reach out. So there you go, folks. If you're interested in applying uh, to be a character interpreter in the future, make sure you put on your resume. Resume contains the arc of light, and uh, you know you'll, you'll at least have three three leaders here who'll know exactly what you're talking about, and we'll we'll, we'll flag you for for that next step. Uh, so we've really discussed a lot about uh, Mary's role in really developing this this concept of character interpretation, how it has evolved over time. Beth and Christy, thank you so much for your insights into a lot of the challenges and and the unique ways of, of training and learning to do this, this very special uh, type of work that requires very talented people. Um, so I've got an open question. I think I want to hear from all three of you. Um, what are your thoughts on the future of character interpretation? So is this kind of concept of museum theater with set spaces and more controllable environments the way to go? Or is there still space for this kind of random encounters out on the grounds in this free flowing uh, experience? Um, I don't know, any, I don't, anyone want to go first on that? I will bow to the younger generation here. <laughs> I think there's room for both. I mean, I, I think we need all of it uh, as an entry point for guests. And, and just understanding that those, those encounters, you know, I loved what Beth was saying as they send folks out two by two um, so, that, so that they're able to have those random encounters in a relatively safe way. And, and if it becomes unsafe, they have a, they have a way to get out, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that those types of approaches, including from scripted to unscripted to improvisational to the full-fledged, full throaty character interpretation where you can actually do what your character did in terms of the physical work and you can maintain that persona. I think that that is, that is absolutely, um, all of those things are the future. Just like there's no one way to teach in a classroom, there's no one way to do this. Yeah, yeah completely agree with Christy. There's no one interpreter that's better than another. Uh, a trades interpreter, a site, you know, somebody, a general guide, or a character interpreter, all of them are taking us back to the past. All of them are giving us a hook to see the founding generation and to see why and who we came from as, as Americans. So I, I think it's strong either way. Uh, I will certainly advocate both and I hope other institutions do as well because it is a very, very solid way to connect people to the humanity of the people that came before us. I think it's crucial too that uh, the leaders in, in these institutions have a very clear plan and vision of where they want to go in, in the future and how all of these interpretations fit into that goal. So that there are clearer messages. Again, that, that we, are, we are living in a time where we want to hear so many more voices. But we, as, uh, as with the choral music, you have to have them blending in at some point. You have to be singing mm -hmm. of it together. Mm -hmm. And the beauty is that, that there's many shadings to that. It requires everyone on staff, I think, to be alerted to how we can better prepare our visitors and, and, and our staff for this. I think it's an exciting new world, but it's going to take a lot of skill. There's so much more ahead of us. And, you know, we're all becoming Americans as that old theme uh, that we used at Colonial Williamsburg. And maybe just to embrace the fact that we are in a state of becoming, that there, we haven't reached that goal, that we're all, all going ahead on that path with uh, assurance together. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So I, 
I was looking through the comments while you guys were talking, and it's mostly just effusive praise for Mary and the work that, that you've done, which I think is definitely appropriate uh, for the evening. But if uh, maybe we can take a few questions from our audience. Uh, so, Kathy Boyle, what do people want to know most about Martha? Any questions over the years surprise you? There have been some uh, uh, that have been that one can expect constantly. And it was uh, a question that I remember asking when I was first here uh, working with our, our researcher, because he met us. Very basic questions. Why didn't the Washingtons have children of their own? People want to know. I think in this in this world we're living in, where everything can be overcome, infertility, people don't understand that in those days you simply, things just happened and you accepted the situation uh, you were in. There wasn't one particular person who was at fault, uh, as they asked me, whose fault was it? That, that's a question that just, you know. Um, and, and, and they're, they're um, very trite questions sometimes about everything about the general's teeth, you know, and I try to, I try to, to get to the, the greater story there, which is while he was suffering from terrible problems, dental problems, he still found the strength to go on every day and, and do great work. But uh, I think the, the questions that, that are the most important to me are about character and how, how did Mrs. Washington feel when she was with the soldiers and, and uh, what made the general be always so beloved by uh, those around him? What qualities of character did he have? And that's, that's so important because I think there are certain virtues that are, are universal and they embody that. So I tend to want to get away from the surface and talk more about the character of these people forged by great tragedies. Most of our visitors have no idea that Mrs. Washington lost all four of her children and uh, the sorrows of, of a child who was ill, all these private experiences that they were enduring while they were trying to lead the nation. That is a, a rare privilege to be able to open up that view of these leaders that they've only seen in the stiff portraits and make them into a family experiencing. I, I've seen our visitors really respond to what they what they see about these uh, sorrows and illnesses, for example. Thank you very much, Mary. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, Sandy Clark Fisher asks, loved our visit with Mary during the Women of Mount Vernon tour. We'd like to hear from her and her best memories of being Mrs. Washington. My best memories of being Mrs. Washington. Oh, good heavens. Uh, I, I think that uh, what has always delighted me is being here on the grounds, uh, coming in, and uh, I've been known as Lady Washington to the people in security and, and the staff, and just feeling uh, almost, I think, uh, people will begin to say to me, do you ever think that you really are Mrs. Washington? And I'll say, no, of course not. But then I'll see some dust somewhere and say, well, shouldn't we get that cleaned up? You know, and I have to be reminded by the gentleman who portrayed uh, my beloved general. And I remember you're not really Martha Washington, even though you, you are taking on this, uh, this role. You know, that's such an important part too. You are, as a character, you're as a, um, a holistic uh, uh, position. You have to know every part of that person's life. And even to create memories that you yourself can live out in your mind so that when you're responding to a visitor, you've, you've lived out, say, your wedding day. And it, it has reality because you've lived it out in your mind. So you have to have that universal knowledge. But by the same token, you can never let yourself actually believe that you are that person. That is the kiss of death. You can never step outside and look at yourself and think, oh, I'm really, I'm really doing this as, as Mrs. Washington. No, I, I'm only an instrument of interpretation. I know that. I know that I'm saying things that, and I'm giving away personal aspects of, of their family and experience that she would never do. And I hope that that can be forgiven because as I said before, that helps to understand the real people. So I guess for me, it's just that I've been Lady Washington here at Mount Vernon to all the staff. And 
I like it when people come past the visit. Hi, Martha, you know, <laughs> that makes me feel uh, very much that they are accepting this as, as the experience of, of coming home to the, the real Mount Vernon. Great. Okay. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, thank you, Mary, once again. Um, so I don't, was that the uh, last question or do we have one more? It's like that was the last one. So Mary, I, I, I want to, before we close up for the evening, I want to give, uh, let you know that your fame is not just limited to those uh, in the museum field here in Virginia, but all the way across the pond in, in England. Uh, we oh. had one more individual who, who really wanted to participate, uh, but was unable to. Uh, Mark Wallace uh, has a, a lovely <laughs> video for you. Hopefully we'll be able to pull it up here in just a moment. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, I know Chris, you'll enjoy this. I believe uh, Mark was the uh, mutual friend that Christy uh, was talking about for that, that trip to England, correct? Very much so. Mm -hmm. Mary Wiseman's fame has spread over the pond, as we say. Yes, indeed, I'm calling you from England, from London, and this is not the set of Masterpiece Theatre, it's actually my little house built in, in 1520, so some of you I know it feels like Masterpiece Theatre. But Mary herself is a masterpiece, she makes masterpieces. She has influenced me my entire working life. My name is Mark Wallace, and for many years I worked at Coerley Williamsburg as an as a actor interpreter, character interpreter, and also as a consultant for many, many years. And in the early 80s, I was one of Mary's eight character interpreters. She taught me so much about how to bring to life people from the past. Incredible skills that she has. Anyone who's seen her, and that's a lot of people, as Martha Washington at Mount Vernon, cannot help but be spellbound by her amazing skills. In fact, I brought her and Christy Coleman, a dear friend, to take part in an 18th century festival that I used to run for many years at Tunbridge Wells in Kent. Mary and Christy added enormously to the, uh, to the occasion, and I think they thoroughly enjoyed it, and we certainly enjoyed having them. So I now run past Pleasures Limited. I founded it at Williamsburg, but brought it to Britain, and we work for the Royal Palaces, the Tower of London, Hampton Court Palace, and prestigious sites around the UK. Personally, I also travel around the world advising people on how to become historical characters, all of which I learned from Mary herself. I can give no warmer or truer recommendation to Mary uh, for her leaving party now, for all the debt that all of us owe her. She's a remarkable woman, and um, it's late here now, but uh, she, it's past my bedtime. But it's worth staying up for Mary, I think. There's no one like her in the world. Oh, lovely. Oh, what a lovely thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, thank you. Oh, you're very welcome, Mary. As you can see, you've had an impact on so many people. Um, and I, I just felt that this was the most appropriate way for us to celebrate uh, and honor your work, not only as Martha Washington, uh, not only in the field of, of just preparing so many great people to continue on that work, but but personally, I want to say thank you. I, I always look forward to our weekly now talk phone chats uh, since your retirement. I myself am continuing to learn so much. Uh, you are a wonderful person. And I know that my life has been enriched by, by meeting you and getting to know you. So uh, thank you so much uh, for all that you do. Thank you to Beth Kelly and to Christy Coleman for taking the time out of their super busy schedules to join us in honor Mary Wiseman. Oh, thank uh, you all so very much. I, I hope I can see you in person very soon. I that in New Camp, nice. where Martha was born, remember, I'm getting close there, back again. And Jeremy, you haven't heard the last of me yet. I'm always available to give advice. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Happy well, thank retirement, you, Mary. Oh, oh, sorry, Christy. No, thank I was you, just saying and... happy retirement, darling. Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anyone else has deserved it more. You, you really all pretty much rendered me what I've really never been before, and that's speechless. I just, <laughs> just, and Mark was the icing on the cake there. Wasn't it? So thank yeah. you. Thank you, everyone, and for the responses, too. I, I thoroughly enjoyed all these years, and um, I hope I get to see everybody soon. But thank you, and thanks to Mrs. Washington for letting me follow her around all these years. So uh, in closing, I uh, would just like to once again thank our donors, the Richard S. Reynolds Foundation of Richmond, Virginia. Thank you all for being such a great audience. And thank you one last time.
to Mary Wiseman. Good night, everyone. Good night. <laughs>